Hello everyone, welcome to the InfoSec Train. My name is Ayush and I will be your instructor for this entire session. In this particular session, we are going to discuss interview question specifically on AWS. I am not only going to discuss question answer, but also I will explain the concept so that you don't have to cram these answer. If you learn the concept, then you can easily address interview question and as well as you can structure your own answer. Hello everyone, welcome to the InfoSec Trade. My name is Ayush and I will be your instructor for this entire session. In this particular session, we are going to discuss interview question specifically on AWS. I am not only going to discuss question and answer, but also I will explain the concept so that you don't have to cram this answer. If you learn the concept, then you can easily address the interview question and as well as structure your own answer. Now, before starting with AWS interview question, I would like to give you some interview tips how to address questions, okay? So first thing you have to keep in mind is that you don't need to explain each and everything about question that is asked to you. Second thing you have to keep in your mind that is for scenario-based question, take your own time and think about the best possible way of solving that question. So now, team, without wasting time, let's get started with AWS interview question. And today's agenda will be a, uh, discussing AWS interview questions. So it is very clear. Now, team, starting with the first question, how will you differentiate between DynamoDB and SimpleDB? So team, first difference is about indexing. Simple DB creates index for every field in a table while DynamoDB, if you set indexing fields before creating the database and cannot be modified. It means team, if you are creating a table in DynamoDB, you need to set index first and then only you would be able to create a table and you cannot modify afterwards. Okay, now if we talk about pricing, Simple DB pricing is based on machine hours and storage capacity, while DynamoDB charge money by capacity of read write records per second. And if we talk about scalability, Simple DB requires manual partitioning if data storage exceeds 10 GB. But if we talk about DynamoDB, DynamoDB automatically distributes data under the hood, thus provide very high scalability. And one more thing, team, simple DB has a storage limitation of 10 GB. However, Dynamo DB has no storage limitation for the data. It is highly scalable in terms of both storage and computational. And simple DB can handle max up to 25 read write operation. And there is no search limit in Dynamo DB. So that's why team Dynamo DB is flexible and efficient database model available in Amazon Web Service for you to have flexible and faster NoSQL database. While SimpleDB is one of AWS Amazon service, it is a distributed database and highly available NoSQL data store that offloads database administrators work. And team, oh, one more thing, we can call DynamoDB as a successor of SimpleDB. Now team, moving uh, to the next question. So our next question is explain VPC and VPC peering connection. So let's take both of these one by one. So let's pick first one that is VPC. So VPC is known as virtual private cloud that enables you to launch AWS resources into your virtual network. It allows users to design and customize network configuration as per business requirement okay so first of all team what is vpc vpc is virtual private cloud and it enables you to launch aws sources into virtual network it means that team you are creating your own private network on aws and you can launch your own aws resources using vpc okay and it allows users to design and customize network configuration it means it will give you full access or full control so that you can customize things as per your business requirement. Now, what is the purpose of Amazon VPC? 
So Amazon VPC enables you to build a virtual network in a cloud so that you can define your network space and control how your network and EC2 resources inside your network are exposed to the internet. Now you can take an example team. Now you're having one VPC here, for example, team, then you have another VPC here. Okay. Now what you can do, you can just have multiple instances in these VPC. So now team, it's up to me whether I have to make these instances public or private. So what I can do, I can make first one. This is as public and second one as private, right? So, but what I am going to do, so why I'm using uh, this model is called as best and host and why we are using it for now, take an example team. Now my first instance uh, is my web server. This is my application server where I want public to access it just to, uh, for example, I am hosting a shopping website. Now I want uh, these public to access my, this server for shopping, right? Now I am having my another instance that is private, right? So I really don't want these people to access my private instance directly. So what they will do, these users will just log into my application using first instance and then they will be able to access this instance using first one right so by using a vpc you can do all of these things now if we talk about components of vpc uh, we have components of vpc like ipv4 ipv6 uh, we have subnet creations row tables internet connectivity elastic ip address and network subnet security and additional networking services that we can use now, Tim, what are the advantages of VPC? It is highly scalable and reliable. It provides a facility of instance scalability so that you can instantly scale your resources up or down, select Amazon EC2 instance type and size that are right for your application. It also helps to save the extra cost as there are no upfront cost. Now team, let's discuss about VPC pairing. So what is VPC pairing connection? So VPC pairing connection is a network connection that creates connection among the VPCs with one another and it allows route traffic between two VPCs using IPv6 and IPv4 address. Instance within the VPCs acts as they are in the same network. Now to you take an example. This is my first instance, the first VPC, and this is my second VPC. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to have instance in this VPC as well. Now I'm using something called as VPC pairing connection here. Now these two VPC can easily communicate with each other. It means that instances can share data as they are on the same VPC. So using VPC pairing connection, we can just connect VPCs, right? And using VPC pairing connection, we can route traffic between VPCs. Now moving to next question. Okay. Now moving to next question team. So what is Amazon EC2 root device volume? So team, when you launch an instance, the root device volume contains the image you use to boot the instance. When we introduce Amazon EC2, all AMIs were backed up by Amazon EC2 instance store, which means the root device for an instance launch from the AMI is an instance store volume created from template that is stored in Amazon S3. After we introduce Amazon EBS, we introduce AMIs that are backed up by Amazon EBS. This means that root devices for an instance launch from the AMI is an Amazon EBS volume created from Amazon EBS snapshot. So you can use between any of these uh, EC2 instance store or Amazon EBS, but I would like to recommend you always go for Amazon EBS because they launch faster and use persistent storage. So now team, moving to next question. So next question is explain the procedure to send the request to Amazon S3. So first of all, Amazon S3 is a REST service. So you can 
send request to Amazon S3 using the REST API or the AWS SDK wrapper libraries that wrap the underlining Amazon S3 REST API. And it will be simplifying your programming task. And adding on this, every interaction with Amazon S3 is either authenticated or anonymous. Okay, so now moving to the next question team. What is T2 instance? T2 instance is one of the low cost Amazon instance that provides a baseline CPU performance or what we can call like burstable performance instance that provides a baseline uh, level of CPU performance with the ability to burst above the baseline. T2 instance works well with Amazon EBS general purpose SSD volumes and T2 instance are available to use in the AWS free tier. So team, whenever uh, you are just going for demos or you are using for the personal purpose. So I will recommend you always use T2 or T3 instances so that it will come under free tier and these T2 instances are free for 750 hours of Linux and Windows each month, at least for one year for new AWS customer. It means that if you're having a new account, it will be having free tier up till one year and you would be having 750 hours per month. So now team moving to the next question, what is Amazon SQS name the types of queues in SQS. So team, first of all, SQS is called as simple queue service whose job is to manage the message queue, right? So it's like SQS job is to manage message queue. So you can use the service to move the data or message from one application to another even though it is not in the active or running state. Now team, I'm just going to tell you an example. Now you can, can take an example. You are having once you are, you are just dividing your application into two parts, right? So it is first part. Okay. And then we are having second part. Okay. Now in between, we are having something called as queue service. Cool team. In between, we are having something called as queue service, right? Now, what will happen team? Now, take an example. I'm just uh, dividing my application in two parts. So this is the shopping website. So first part, what we'll do first, this will take orders from customers and I'm calling it as producers. And I am calling my second part that will process these orders that is called as consumer, right? So now what I'm going to do, now producer will take orders from users, right? Now, what will happen team? So this type of scenario is called decouple, right? So what will happen now? Like consumer will poll for messages, right? Is there any message after like every 30 second or 40 second? Now, what will happen team? Now, if a customer placed a order, what will happen? Producer will send a message to Q. Producer will send a message to Q and Q will store these messages in Q database and will just send these messages whenever consumer will ask for it, right? So in this way, this service is working. Now, by this way, this service will work. And SQS can send message among multiple services, including S3, DynamoDB, EC2 instance, and, and it is also used Java message queue service to deliver the information, okay? And one more team, if you are just using decouple structure that I have shown you, what is the advantage of this? The advantage of this is that if my producer is failed or my one part, any part that is producer consumer is failed, then it's still uh, my application will work. Now team, take an example, my consumer uh, part is not working, but still my customer will able to place order. So by this way team, my whole application will not go down and still it will be working fine. Now let's talk about benefits of SQS. Benefits of SQS are keep sensitive data secure, reliably deliver messages, scale elastically and cost effectively. And it's also eliminate administrative overhead. Now, a message can be visible in the SQS up to 12 hours, right? 
and there are like two types of SQS. First one is standard. Second one is FIFO. If we talk about standard queues, standard queues are the default queue type, and it offers unlimited number of transaction per second and the option of delivering a message once. So it means that team it can just have any number of throughput. Second thing is the team if you are using a standard queue, then it will just try to follow the best or what we say. You, it will try to preserve the order, but messages in standard queues not follow the exact order. So for standard queue, you can take an example of go on shopping mall, right? So you are having their billing lane. So what you are going to do team when you are going for billing. So you don't, you are just not going one by one, right? So if you see that like there are like four counters and in one of the counter, you see that like there is a little bit. A less rush or there is no rush. So what you will do? You will just go there and clear your bills and you can move out easily. So this structure is called a standard queue. Okay. Now, if we talk about FIFO, FIFO queues are designed to ensure that the orders of message is received and sent is strictly preserved in the exact order they were sent. Now for FIFO, you can take an example. If you go to a restaurant now, there is a specific order, right? So first of all, you will get starters, then what you will get a uh, main course, then you will get sweets. But now take an example. If you go to the restaurant and the person served you first of all sweets. So this is not a good idea, right? So FIFO will preserve the exact order. And, but, but there is a one more disadvantage, like FIFO will be having a uh, limited throughout put. It means that there will be limited number of transactions per second. Okay. Now team, moving to the next question. Now, what are the regions and availability zones in Amazon EC2? Amazon Web Service has a comprehensive infrastructure that is spread worldwide and it is split into availability zones and regions. And team, as we all know that Amazon Web Service has a massive infrastructure and this infrastructure is divided into availability and regions. So first of all, regions are something called as uh, regions are the geographic region or geographic places from where AWS is operating. And these geographic regions or geographic places are just divided into isolated places that we call availability zones and each region is fractionated into geographic area. So now let me show you how this will work. Okay. So first of all, we are having one region here. So there will be a region. So you can take an example. This is my Mumbai region. Cool team. So this is my Mumbai region. And in this, I will be having different isolated availability zone. So there can be three or more than three availability zones, right? So like there are three availability zones, AZ1, AZ2, and AZ3. So I'm just giving them name one, two, and three. So I am having a complete region in Mumbai. And this region is divided into three availability zones that is one, two, and three. And these are completely isolated and power supply and each and everything is different. Now these, all these three availability zones are connected through high redundant network links. Okay. These are connected through high redundant network links with high throughput. Now all these availability zones are separated by hundred kilometer boundary and there is no specific region behind it why we are uh, separating these availability zones by 100 kilometer boundary and this is just a distance or what we call as a idea used by aws right so this is about availability zone and region cool team now moving to the next question team Next question we are having is called as mention the type of instances available, right? So there are like five types of instances available. So first one, we are having something called as general purpose. So in general purpose instances, so general purpose instances provide a balance of compute memory and networking resources and can be used for variety of diverse workloads. These instances are ideal for application that use these resources in equal proportions, such as web servers and code repositories. Now, what all instances comes under general purpose? That is T2, T3, T4, 
M4, M5 and M6. Now, if we talk about compute optimized, compute optimized are ideal for compute bound applications that benefits from high performance processor. Instance belonging to this family are well suited for batch processing workload, media transcoding, scientific modeling and gaming servers, machine learning and other compute intensive applications. And the instance series that falls under this category are C4, C5, C6, and C7. Now, if you talk about memory optimized instances, these are designed to deliver fast performance for workloads that process large data sets in memory, such as SAP, SQL, and NoSQL databases. And the instance series that falls under this category are R4, R5, R6, X1, and X2. Now, another type of instance we are having that is called as storage optimized instance. And these are designed for workloads that require high sequential read and write access to a very large data sets on local storage. And they are optimized to deliver 10 of thousands of low latency and random input output operations per second to applications. And the instance series that falls under this category is H1, D2, and D3. Now, at last, we have accelerated computing instances, and these are used for hardware accelerators or coprocessors to perform functions such as floating number calculations, graphic processing, or data pattern matching. And the instance series that falls under this category are P2, P3, P4, P5, F1, G3, G4, and G5. Now let's move to the next question. What are the best security practices for Amazon EC2? So if we talk about best practices for Amazon EC2 that must be followed are security and network. So if we talk about security, so what all points we can just memorize about security, we should manage access to AWS resources and API using identity federation, I am users and I am roles. Second thing we can keep in our mind is that implement the least permissions rules for your security groups and regularly patch update and secure the operating system and application on your instances. And at last, what you can do, you can use Amazon inspector to automatically discover and scan EC2 instances for software vulnerabilities and unintended network exposure. Now, if we talk about network, so you should set detail value for your application to 255. Okay. If you set a smaller value, then there will be a risk that TTL will value will expire while application traffic is in transit. So it can cause reachability issue for your instance. Now, another best practice we are having that is storage. Okay. So for storage, you should understand the implications of the root device type for data persistent backup and recovery. Use separate Amazon EPS volumes for the operating system and your data. Use instance store volume for your instance to store temporary data and always encrypt EBS volumes and snapshot. Now, if we talk about resource management, use instance metadata and custom resources tags to track and identify your AWS resources. View your current limits for Amazon EC2. And you can also use those advisor to inspect your AWS environment and then make recommendations when opportunities exist to save money. Now, if you talk about recovery and backup, regularly backup your EBS volume using Amazon EBS snapshot and create AMI from your instance to save the configuration as a template for launching future instance. Deploy critical components of your application across multiple AGs and replicate your data appropriately. Regularly test the process of recovering your instance and EBS volumes. Okay. 
now in moving to the next question you mentioned the possible connection issue one might face while connecting to your instance so one can face the following connection issues while connecting to an instance so first issue can be error user or like error can be user key not recognized by server so if you're getting this error verify that your private key that is spam file has been converted to the format recognized by putty.ppk if you are using putty and if you are getting error permission denied or authentication failed then what you need to do and also you are getting like connection timeout so what you need to do check your security groups okay and if you talk about authentication failed or permission denied you should verify that you are connecting within with the appropriate user name for the mi okay so if you're getting authentication field or permission field, you should check appropriate username for your AMI. And if you're getting connection timeout, so you should check your security group rules. Now, if you're getting unprotected private key, so for that, your private key must be protected from read write operation from any other user.